Mark Twain once characterized golf as a good walk spoiled, and like all avid golfers, I love golf, except when I hate it. I was introduced to the game by my mom, who was a childhood phenom in Webster Groves, Missouri, and remained a competitive golfer throughout her life. In fact, she and my dad live at a retirement community in Florida, and she's been the club champ there for 14 years in a row. But when I was in high school, I was a tennis player, pretty good one, and the two forms sort of competed. Swinging a golf club and hitting a forehand didn't really help each other, and so I stopped playing golf. And when I got commissioned and got to my first couple of squadrons, I, I played recreationally, but not very seriously. Now, when I became a RAG instructor in 1994, that changed. So VF-101 in those days was what we call a golfing squadron. The CO, Captain Chris Wietrich, who has passed away since that time, was a huge golfer, and it was actually a valid excuse matrix to say, hey, I'm not on the flight schedule, I'm golfing. I sort of took my golf to the next level in those years that I was a RAG instructor. Started taking lessons there at the Naval Air Station Oceana, and decided, hey, it's time to start breaking 90 in terms of my score for 18 holes. We all had these naugahyde bags made to carry clubs, and it kind of looked like a rifle case, but you could fit 14 clubs in there and two sleeves of balls, and you could tuck two sets down the canopy rail behind the rear seat. And so we would do that when we were doing detachments to, say, Fallon or El Centro or whatever, Key West. And when you got there, those two Naugahyde bags, very small profile, did not scream fraud, waste, and abuse. It sort of looked like, oh, they have rifles. Okay, that makes sense, they're fighter guys. We would make our flight plans based on how is the golf at the intermediate stop to where we're going. It was sort of like Apocalypse Now. You remember the Robert Duvall character when they're surfing said, you either surf or you fight. So in VF 101, it was you either golf or you fly. So I got my handicap pretty low and I became a golf addict, not just a guy who you know, was exposed to the game and dealt with it in passing, but seriously a golf addict. So when I was the air wing ops officer aboard George Washington, we actually formed a USGA sanctioned body called the Carrier Air Wing One Golf Association, Kawoga. And I was the director and I had an E2 pilot who was my secretary and some other officers. We opened up membership to the ship's company and not just the air wing. And it turned out to be a kind of a cool thing. So we were on workups in 1997 and because of the notoriety of Kuoga, I had made friends with a few of the guys at PGA Tour Productions. And I was actually on the phone with them from my desk aboard the USS George Washington in the CAG Ops spaces. I could actually just dial nine and the number and get wherever I wanted in the world. It was kind of cool. And I'm talking to this guy named Chris at PGA Tour Productions and basically pitched him on the idea of filming an episode of Inside the PGA Tour aboard the USS George Washington while we were at sea off of North Carolina. And he loved the idea. And so the only issue was who's going to be the host. So back in those days, this is before Golf Channel, or maybe Golf Channel had been invented, but it hadn't really taken off yet. So inside the PGA Tour was on ESPN. So we get word that the host is going to be Payne Stewart. Of course, everybody knows Payne Stewart because of the way he would dress with his plus fours and his tamashan. And he was also well known as a, at this time, 10-time tour winner who had won the U.S. Open in 1991. Flashy, very type A kind of guy. So he flew out aboard a cod with the production team from PGA Tour Productions. And I met him at the cod, the C2 that he flew aboard in, and escorted him up to the Admiral's spaces. And we kind of went through the itinerary. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to have dinner with the Admiral and the Captain here in the flag mess, and then we're going to take it to the ready rooms and hang out with the aviators, and then maybe down to the Intelligence Center and show you how that happens. And he kind of patiently listened, and he said, well, when do I get to talk to the crew? Where do they eat? 
So man of the people. And so we were like, okay, got it. We took him down to the mess decks, second deck. And he immediately drew a crowd. And he would not leave those guys. Signing things, talking about golf to the sailors. They really loved that he was there. And we loved that his focus was on the guys who keep the ship working at the lowest levels of the rank structure. So the timeline was completely busted, but we managed to get all of the shots that the PGA Tour Productions team wanted to get, including the last shot was something that Payne and I cooked up where I was his caddy for a whole of a PGA Tour event, and it looked like this. Thank you, thank you. Well, what's mileage? Uh, first hole, it's uh, 110 nautical miles per carry. It's 115 to the hole. I think that's a driver. Yeah, but first off, I want to thank everybody on the USS George Washington, all these guys back here, everybody that's made our stay, allowing us to host inside the PGA Tour from the ship. a very special day and a very special show. So thanks to all these folks and uh, I think I think I can get there with a driver, the huh? Let's the shot. You don't want to leave it short in this water hazard. Oh. That's on the beach. Yeah, I think my, my mileage is off a little bit. Well, because I hit that good. Yeah, you did. You did it again. You know? And I, I, if I hit a good driver, that's definitely a, you know, 115 mile shot. I know, I know. Uh, that's why I wanted to work for you. But well, I think it's my fault. you're not going to be working long. You keep doing the, these uh, kind of numbers. Yeah, that's exactly right. I'll do better. So that episode aired later in the summer of 1997. And before he left, the battle group commander a name you should recognize because he went on to be the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. In fact, Admiral Mike Mullen was in the room during the Bin Laden raid, and you remember that famous photo from the Situation Room. He is shown prominently there. At the time that we had Payne aboard the ship, he was a one-star, went on to have four stars and lead not just the Navy, but the entire U.S. military. Before he got on the cod to fly off, Admiral Mullen asked Payne, would you like to fly in the back of an F-14 at some point? And Payne said, absolutely. So we said, okay, let's put a pin in that idea. We got to go on deployment and we will keep in touch. So we went on deployment, went initially to the Mediterranean and played golf wherever we could. Our first round during deployment was at Caesarea, which is an Israeli golf course built on Roman ruins. But as we pulled out of that port, we were informed we're going to the Gulf. We were ordered out of the Mediterranean, through the Suez, into the Gulf to assist with Operation Southern Watch, which was the patrolling of the no-fly zone below the 33rd parallel in southern Iraq. So as we transited the Suez Canal, we used that opportunity to practice our golf. You see this picture here, I'm hitting balls off the fantail of the George Washington. This picture is actually, if I know some of you are going to go, hey, hold it, that's the Sinai behind you you've got to be northbound. That's correct. But that's the only picture I have. So we did hit golf balls on the way south as well. It was a lot of fun. I don't know if it's legal these days, but back then we had laundry bags, mesh laundry bags full of golf balls, and we'd spend the day hitting them. And in some cases, the Suez is so narrow you can actually reach the shore. So we got to the Gulf, flew Operation Southern Watch missions, and pulled into Dubai which is a golfing city, I will say. Played the Emirates, Dubai Creek, those courses are fantastic. Both of those courses have hosted the Dubai Desert Classic. And we became friends with the tournament director of the Dubai Desert Classic, a guy named Bob Wilkinson. Kind of kept our game going while we were also flying these real world missions. Now during that time, I would speak to Payne occasionally from that same phone that I talked to PGA Tour Productions off the east coast of North Carolina. Again, all I had to do was dial nine and the number, and I could bounce off satellites and talk to whoever I wanted. And occasionally I would check in with Payne, and he was just amazed that I was talking to him from an aircraft carrier located in 
the Persian Gulf, and that was a lot of fun. So we kept in touch, kept the idea of him flying in the back of a Tomcat on the front burner, and so he was thinking about what his schedule was going to be in 1998. So one day during a very busy period of flying off southern Iraq, I, I saw this email in my inbox from Payne Stewart Enterprises. It said, Dear Ward, drop 18 bombs on Saddam and Kawoga will have a new golf course. Fly safe. We'll see you guys when you get home. Payne. So that meant a lot to us that Payne Stewart was thinking about us during those busy days. So we get back from that deployment and I arrange to fly down to coordinate the final details with Payne in person when he was playing at Hilton Head. That was actually my last flight in the F-14. So Shaggy Alwine is another member of the CAG staff. He was CAG LSO and I took a VF-102 Tomcat from Oceana down to Beaufort where our Marine Corps Hornet Squadron was and one of our Navy Hornet Squadrons as well. So we flew down there. One of the Marine captains was a huge golf fan so he drove us to Hilton Head and we followed Payne around for uh, his first round of, the, of that tournament down in Hilton Head. And we nailed down the date that he was going to fly. So it was going to be during the Michelob tournament at Kingsmill in Williamsburg. It's a tournament that doesn't exist on the PGA Tour anymore. We get to the week of the tournament. Payne flies his Learjet from Callaway Gardens in Georgia where the previous tournament was held right to NAS Oceana. So the base XO of Oceana at this time was an old skipper of mine, a very avid golfer, and he arranged for Payne's airplane to be able to land at Oceana. Payne's Learjet lands, we're waiting for him there at the transient line. Side door opens, beers are flying out. We're catching the beers and it's, it's Payne. He's like, hey, good to see you guys. So we checked into the BOQ, the Bachelor Officer's Quarters, where we were living. Now, by this time, I'd moved from Virginia Beach up to Annapolis because I was starting to teach at the Naval Academy, but I came back to do this event and be Payne's host. So, again, the XO let us use a couple of the VIP suites at the BOQ, so we drop our gear off, and then we press right into town and have dinner at one of the nice restaurants at Virginia Beach. So we had an entourage of sorts, some, some of the local golfers and some of the Navy people from, from the area, as well as some of the public affairs types joined us. So we're around this big table at this restaurant. And the thing about Payne is when he wasn't wearing that hat and his plus fours, people didn't really recognize him. So we're sitting there laughing and getting ready for our meal to show up. and. This, this woman shows up at the table from the bar adjacent to the dining room and she's got this little piece of paper and she asks, which one of you is Payne Stewart? So we're all looking around and so Payne points to George McDonald who is a Virginia Beach based golfer and good friend of mine and he points to George McDonald so she hands George the piece of paper and George writes down in kind of scribbly cursive, George McDonald hands it back to her and she walks away. Doesn't even look at the paper, right? So we have dinner and then that just didn't sit right with Payne. So as we're walking out, he goes to find her and says, no, actually I, I'm Payne Stewart. And he signs in front of her, her significant other as well. So that was, again, Payne is a super nice guy. He wasn't gonna, you know, not allow this person to have an autograph ultimately. So we did a little after dinner action down at the Strip at Virginia Beach. Again, this entourage. And a buzz starts that, hey, Payne Stewart is here. So that was kind of fun to be in the entourage and, and listen to Payne talk to the fans and, and the other well-wishers that we ran into. And then we look at our watch and it's like two in the morning. And we've got to be up early the next morning to take Payne to the Naval Air Station at Norfolk so he can do his required training to allow him to fly in the Tomcat. So we wake up at six in the morning. We were feeling some effects of the night before, but we pressed on like good fighter guys and Payne was totally into it. We go over there and so this training involved the hyperbaric chamber where Payne was introduced to the feeling of hypoxia. What happens when you're at high altitude and there's not a lot of oxygen and your brain starts to not function right. 
So you get to feel what that's like, and you also get to sort of figure out when are you basically at the point where you've got to put your mask back on. Payne was very receptive to the training and did great. Put his mask back on at the right time, and Payne did the ejection seat dynamic trainer as well. So we pressed back to Oceana after that training, got his qual, and we were supposed to do a simulator, but he and I look at each other like, I kind of want to re-rack, and he's like, yes, because there's a word in the English language. It's called no. So I called the rag and said, hey, we're going to miss the, the simulator, and they were okay with that. After we re-racked a little bit, it was time now for Payne to host a clinic at the driving range at Oceano. Vinny the Pro had put out some stands, and they were full, and there were people standing around, and, and Payne just did this really great for all abilities clinic. And after that, we did a nine hole exhibition. Joining us for that exhibition was Admiral Mullen. The highlight for me was I out drove him on number two. Um, that's back when I was flexible, but that was it. And so Payne shot an oh by the way, three under while he's talking to the crowd and having a good time. And just an amazing thing to watch and, and what a gift as a golfer to be able to play nine holes with Payne Stewart. And then that night, he hosted a banquet for the local golf community at the Officers Club at Oceana. So now we get plenty of sleep, wake up the next morning, and I take him to VF-102's hangar so he can brief the flight in the Tomcat. He's flying with the XO, the Executive Officer Commander Pokey Molidor. Before we started the airplane, I sat in the cockpit and showed him where everything is. And then Pokey jumps in, we start the airplane, I get an alignment and get all the other gear going, the radios and, and everything else. Then Pokey shuts down the left motor, I hop out, Payne hops in, I strap him in, make sure that everything's hooked up. G-suit, O2 hooked up, he does a comms check with Pokey, good to go. Give him a handshake and I get down, close the ladders and they taxi out. About 45 minutes later, they come back. And we're waiting for them there on the uh, on the line. And the first thing Payne does is they taxi to spot as he holds up an empty puke bag, a badge of honor for somebody that's just had their first fam flight. Shut the airplane down, save the seat. Payne gets out, meet him at the bottom of the ladder. The first thing he does is he finds the plane captain and he thanks him for giving him a great jet. Again, man of the people, not an elitist focused on the troops. And then he talked to the local NBC affiliate, and I'm standing next to some of the Navy public affairs types, and they said to me, this guy is a really good spokesman for the U.S. Navy. And that gave me an idea that I took to the recruiting command in the months that followed. So the other thing I said to him once he got back from his flight, and he had pulled G's and done bombing profiles over the range at Dare County and gone over the water and gone supersonic. I said, Payne, you've now been on the other side of Mach 1. There's wisdom there. You know things your opponents don't. And his expression was kind of like, hmm, he kind of liked that idea. So then Payne and I jumped in my car and we drove up to Kings Mill. So this was Tuesday of the week of the Michelob and this was the shootout. So he gave me his little clip that allows them access to the player's parking lot. So I'm just flashing that and everybody, yeah, come on in. And, you know, park right there among all the other courtesy cars. And it's like who's who on the PGA Tour. As a golf fan, it was bucket list kind of stuff. It was just amazing. You know, Tom Lehman, hey, how are you doing? Fred Funk, Lee Jansen, who that year had just edged him out for his victory in the U.S. Open beat him in the end game there by one stroke in the 98 Open at Olympic Club in San Francisco. So Payne's caddy had not shown up yet. Mike Hicks had not shown up. So I was his caddy for a little while. And so he's on the practice screen hitting these putts and I'm rolling them back to him like I saw the other caddies doing. And Roger Maltby, who's one of the commentators for NBC Sports, comes up to me and he's looking at his bag. He's like, when did he start playing these clubs? And I'm like, you know, I don't know, Roger. I, I'm, I just was the Tomcat guy that was his host as we just flew him. But I don't know, you could ask Payne. So it was really amazing to be inside the ropes with Payne. And then Mike Hicks, Hicksy shows up, 
He's like, okay, you're done. And he took the bag and Payne did the shootout. And then we hung out at the driving range after Payne was done with the shootout. And then I drove back home with the idea that I was gonna come back on Saturday with my wife and we'd hang out some more. So that's what we did. So we said our farewells and turns out that's the last time I saw him in person. But we kept in touch. But one of the ideas we were percolating was U.S. Navy, let the adventure begin, which was the motto at that time. So I socialized this idea with the Navy Recruiting Command. And, you know, as usual for any bureaucracy, they weren't really into unorthodox ideas, to my frustration. And they said, well, we've kind of committed all of our ad dollars to arena football. Because that's where the young folks are these days. Which struck me as off a bit. But we kept the idea alive, and I talked to Admiral Mullen, and I talked to some other folks at the highest ranks, thinking that perhaps they could go top down on the recruiting command, and maybe this would happen. I was also working with Payne's agent, a guy named Van Arden. So under the header of Small World, Van was married to the sister of a classmate of mine, Ed Dawson. So his wife, Deb, was Ed's sister. So he knew a lot about the Naval Academy, and he loved the idea that we were interested in one of his clients, Payne. And he was up for trying to see if we couldn't get Payne to officially wear the Navy colors. And the other idea was wherever he was playing, if he was near a Navy town or a Navy installation, he would do clinics. Also, we wanted him to fly with the Blue Angels. We thought that would be part of the entire package. So all these things were happening. Payne was up for all of it. And Van was pricing it at a huge discount. The other thing Van Ask, he's like, well, what are you doing when you get out of the Navy? Because I was about to get out. I said, I don't know. Um, what do you got? He said, well, have you ever thought of being an agent, a sports agent? I'm like, no, I have not. He goes, well, we might be able to bring you aboard this, this agency, Leader Enterprises, and, uh, and get you going on a, a you know, internship of sorts. Uh, I, I think you'd be good at this, the way that you network and the, the way you present things, I, I think you'd be a good agent. I, I thought that was really a cool idea. I was up for it. So the U.S. Open that year was at Pinehurst, and the final showdown came down to Payne versus Phil Mickelson. So that very dramatic putt with Phil Mickelson watching. If Payne misses the putt, he bogeys the hole, and that makes he and Phil Mickelson tied, so they're going to have to go to a playoff. But, as you can see in this footage, Payne did not miss the putt. And he does that famous fist pump where he kicks his leg up, and then Mike Hicks jumps into his arms, and they have a fantastic celebration. This is now the stuff of PGA Tour legend. After he won the U.S. Open, 1999 continued to be good for Payne. He was a member of the winning Ryder Cup team in Brookline, a very dramatic showdown. And I like to believe his edge was the wisdom that he found on the other side of Mach 1. One day in the fall of 1999, I was sitting in my office at the Naval Academy, grading papers. Phone rings. It's R.J. McNeil. He's a fellow Tomcat Rio West Coast guy who I played a lot of golf with here at the Naval Academy in those days. He says, have you seen the news? I said, no, I'm, I don't have a TV here in my office. Um, what's going on? He goes, well, there's a Learjet flying at altitude and it looks like the pilots are unresponsive. In fact, an F-16 joined on the airplane. It was supposed to turn west in northern Florida, head towards Dallas, and now it's just heading northwest, and nobody's answering the radios or responding to the F-16. So I said, wow, that's, uh, that's weird. He said, yeah, and they think Payne Stewart's on the airplane. So that was a real punch to the gut. In kind of a desperation move, I called Payne's cell phone and I got his voicemail, which was kind of a classic Payne Stewart message. said, hi, you've reached Payne Stewart's phone. He's not with it right now, but if you leave a message, I'll let him know you called. And then the mailbox was full, so I figured a lot of other people had been trying him as well. So I left my office, went to my house. I lived on the Naval Academy grounds in those days, so it wasn't very far away, and started watching CNN. And the nation was gripped by this drama. And because they had the manifest, they knew who was on the airplane. So Payne was on the airplane, along with 
his agents, Robert Fraley and Van Arden. So first one F-16 joined and he saw that the windscreen was glazed over, which was an indication that they had had decompression and that the airplane was no longer heated, that it was freezing inside. And it was flying straight and level at 39,000 feet. The anti-collision lights were on and it was basically on a course north-northwest. So that F-16 ran out of fuel and had to continue on its mission to Illinois. By this time, the White House has been informed. They've done a press conference about this plane because obviously Americans are concerned. The FAA knows about it and they're keeping the corridor that the airplane is on clear, both side to side and above and below. And they start doing the math. How much gas does your average corporate Learjet have? How fast are they going at 39,000 feet? What's the burn rate? And now they launch another section of F-16s. These are out of Tulsa Air National Guard. So they join on them until they have to hit the tanker. There's now a tanker airborne as well. It's quite a military operation. So as they hit the tanker, two more South Dakota National Guard airplanes launch. Once those other two Tulsa F-16s come off the tanker. Now you have four F-16s that are flying escort for this ghost Learjet. Eventually the Learjet runs out of gas. At that point it goes into a spin and dives straight down. One of the F-16s attempted to follow it down, but the pilot lost the Learjet in a cloud deck and he had to peel off. Ultimately the Learjet crashed in Mina, South Dakota. The problem was either the valve failure or pilots missed something on the pre-flight checks and did not turn on the cabin pressurization. This had happened before in 1988. The crew of a Learjet forgot to turn on the cabin pressurization when they were on the ground. They got incapacitated at altitude and then wound up crashing in Mexico and both pilots died. The only solace in my mind is he died a peaceful death of hypoxia and didn't feel any pain. So I was invited to the memorial service down in Orlando as a guest of the agency, Leader Enterprises. And I was among the throng that filled this giant church in Orlando. Paul Azinger gave some great remarks, a fantastic tribute. He started by mimicking Payne's golfing attire. He made Tracy laugh, which was great to see and overall did a fantastic job. It was a very solemn tribute to a good friend and a great father and husband and a great American. So went to the reception. Again, as a golf fan, it was sort of overwhelming, but I was able to talk to Deb Arden, Van's wife, and Tracy. And Tracy was putting on the brave face very strong woman and a very incredible lady. So I was able to write an article for Golf World Magazine, the issue that was dedicated to Payne's memory, about our time with him. And I feel lucky that I was able to get my words out in such a big venue like that. Payne has a great legacy. And among those things is the Payne Stewart Award, which is presented annually by the PGA Tour to a professional golfer who best exemplifies character, charity, and sportsmanship. So the current awardee is Zach Johnson, and this is awarded each year. There's a statue of him behind the 18th at Pinehurst number two. After Payne won the US Open at Pinehurst in 1999, I got a call from Bob Wilkinson, the tournament director at the Dubai Desert Classic. And he was wondering, would Payne be interested in being the American PGA Tour member in the Dubai Desert Classic the following year, meaning 2000. So every year they'd have an American in the field at the Dubai Desert Classic. Freddie Couples has won it, Tigers won it. But in the recent years around that time, they'd had some bad results. Tom Lehman canceled at the last minute and Mark O'Meara wasn't a factor, he almost missed the cut. So Bob's going, I want a great ambassador of the United States because the Emir here in the United Arab Emirates does not meet that many Americans. So the golfer that the PGA Tour sends matters a lot in terms of 
how the emir perceives the United States. I mean, it's like State Department work. I was like, Bob, Payne is the man. He's your guy. So I talked to Van Arden, and Van was like, I, I like the idea, but Payne has told me, do not overbook him. And obviously to fly from Orlando to Dubai is halfway around the world. That would take some time, many time zones. But then I socialized the idea with Payne. And Payne was like, I'll, I'll do it. I love it. I love the idea. So I went top down to Van and said, I think Payne wants to do it. So they started the negotiations. And meanwhile, I talked to Admiral Mullen. So I think Payne's going to play the Dubai Desert Classic which we had been able to attend when we were on deployment in 1998, that year Olafaba won. We were able to talk to Ernie Els and Greg Norman. It was amazing. In fact, Admiral Fargo was the fifth fleet commander then. He's an avid golfer. And he arranged so that the George Washington was in port during those days. And Bob Wilkinson gave us 40 comp tickets and a bus that drove us from the port facility to the Emirates Golf Course. And we were able to hang out that day for the final round and watch Olathalba win. It was fantastic. Admiral Mullen supported this idea and he socialized it with the Chief of Naval Operations and they agreed that if Payne was in the field in 2000, they would do their best to have a carrier in port at Jebel Ali, the port facility there in Dubai, so that he could have a large American gallery, assuming there was no national emergency that required the carrier to be at sea. So Payne Stewart could move aircraft carriers. Why? Well, as the old adage goes, leadership isn't what you say, it's what you do. Payne Stewart wasn't just a golfer, he was a leader. And he was a good friend. So every year around the US Open, I miss him. All right, that'll do it for this episode. If you wanna help me take the channel to the next level, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash wardcarroll. And I look forward to talking to you again soon.